Hello and good morning. My name is Jim Haldeman. I am the Business Development Manager for Instrumentation at Lessman Instrument Company, and I'll be your host. This morning, we'll be discussing achieving optimal results from your industrial weighing system. And our featured speaker is John Drenette. John is currently a Product Manager for Siemens Industry Process Instrumentation Business. He is the current Excuse me. His current role is responsible for sales support and marketing of the weighing technology and process protection products. John has been with Siemens and Miltronics for 32 years. He began his career as a service belt scale and field service engineer and spent 10 years as the service manager for the company's level and weighing products. So with that being said, I'm going to turn it over to John and begin his presentation. Thank you, John. I should also mention that if you have questions, I find it's best to submit your questions via the drop down box on the right of your screen where it mentions questions. Just hit on that icon, lower it, and you'll see where you can enter your questions. And then at the end of the presentation, I will ask John the questions that have been answered, or excuse me, have been asked. So thank you again. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to John. To John. Well, thank you, Jim. Um, as Jim said, my name is John Tronet. I'm the product manager for the weighing technology products at Siemens. And I want to thank everyone for attending today's webinar, Achieving Optimal Results from Your Industrial Weighing System. Today, I'll start out talking about the different types of industrial scales. Uh, we'll go into how strain gauge load cells work. We'll look at the different types of load cells and how each is used. We'll go through the installation requirements for load cells. We'll look at load cell diagnostics, some of the more common sources of error, and then we'll look at some specific application examples. So why is weighing important in the industrial environment? Weighing is typically used for one of three reasons. Uh, they'll either be doing process controls, so reducing the amount of scrap product that's produced or the need to reprocess uh, product because of inaccurate controls. It may be used for inventory controls, so knowing when to order new raw materials. Um, it may be measuring a finished product to know how to schedule your production. Or it may just be fiscal responsibility, so knowing what to report for the books. And finally, they may be using it for custody transfer, knowing how much to bill their customer based on, on weight. Uh, uh, to bill customers for bulk materials is typically done based on weight. Looking at the different types of industrial scales, generally speaking, industrial scales are categorized into three groups. There are non-automatic scales, there are automatic scales, and there are continuous scales. Non-automatic scales require some intervention from the operator or the control system uh, to complete the weight measurement. Uh, examples would be like platform scales, bin weighing systems would be examples of non-automatic scales. A platform scale, I'm sure everybody's aware, it's basically a platform that's mounted on one or more load cells. You put an object on it, it tells you how much it weighs. Uh, bin weighing systems, would you would take a small hopper or a silo. Uh, you would put it on load cells, the entire hopper on load cells. You would calibrate out the weight of the hopper or the silo. And you could know how much product is in there in the container based on uh, the output of the load cells. Automatic scales have the uh, the controls built into the weighing electronics to complete the weight measurement. Some examples of um, automatic scales would be a batching system or a filling system. Uh, check weighers are also considered automatic scales. Now, with a batching system, batching systems, you can have two types. You can have a loss in weight batching system or you can have a gain in weight batching system. If you have a loss in weight batching system, you would have your raw material bins on load cells. Uh, you would bring the, transfer the material from the raw material bin into the mixing bin. And the scale would monitor how much material was being transferred and stop the material transfer when the appropriate amount was added. 
if you had a gain in weight system, the mixer bin would be placed on load cells and it would monitor as each component was added and again, stop the material transfer when the desired set point was, was reached. Filling machines will um, fill containers, just as the name implies. So it could be uh, bags of material or it could be bottles of material. Uh, the material, there would be a scale um, installed underneath the filling station. So the scale would have the controls built into it that would transfer the container onto the scale. Uh, it would Then it would start the material flow stop the material flow when the set point is reached and then index to the next container. Now with, with both batching scales or batching systems and filling machines, they have two objectives. One objective is, is they want to uh, fill as rapidly as possible. And the other objective is they want to hit the set point as precisely as possible. And the way they'll do this is they'll use multiple fill streams. So they'll have a coarse fill stream and a fine fill stream. And the scale electronics will have the controls to switch between the coarse and the fine. So it will start out filling very rapidly. And then when you get to say 90% of the desired amount, it would switch to the sl slower fill stream so that you could hit the set point as precisely as possible. They'll also have algorithms in there to monitor each batch and adapt for any material flow after the the, um, the scale is given the command to stop the material flow. For example, if you stop the material flow, there's still gonna be just a tiny bit of material that's suspended in the air as it falls onto the scale. So these scales will have um, the ability to monitor each batch and say, okay, after um, I completed the batch, I called for 50 pounds, and instead I got 50.1 pounds. So the next time you went through a fill cycle, the scale, the uh, filling scale would stop the material flow at say 49.9 pounds. So knowing that, that there's 0.1 pounds suspended in the fill system between the scale and the thing in the um, in the valve that shuts it off. So uh, so when that all settles out, you should hit your mark um, precisely on your 50 pounds. And this is done uh, with, this can be done with every batch. You can turn it on for a little while to kind of get a feel and then shut it off so it's not continuously updating. So you can kind of control how you how you use that feature in the scale. But, this, uh, but filling scales and batching scales will typically have that functionality built into them. As I mentioned, check weighers are also considered automatic scales. Uh, with a check weighing system, you would have a, uh, a co conveyor that transports, um, this would be discrete items. So this would either be, say, packages of dish detergent or uh, it would be packages of meat. It would be discrete items rolling on this conveyor. Now, this is a roller conveyor. And what they would do to install a check weighing system here is they would cut the uh, conveyor um, in, in a place that's long enough to contain a single package. Uh, they would place that section of the conveyor on load cells. And the load cell and the scale electronics would have the ability to determine when the package is completely on the scale as it moves down the conveyor. Uh, that could be done with a peak hold meter in the scale, or it could also be done with photo eyes to, to monitor when the package is completely on. It. So you would measure discrete packages as they move uh, along the conveyor system. Now I'm showing a roller conveyor here. You could also have a belt conveyor as a check weigher. Uh, with a, a belt conveyor, it would typically use a plate underneath the belt. Most of the time, a, a check weigher, a belt type check weigher, would be a dedicated conveyor just for that scale. In other words, it wouldn't be used to transport. You would have a, a conveyor to put the packages onto the check weighing system and a takeaway conveyor to take the uh, packages off of the conveyor. And the last type of, um, of industrial scale is the continuous scale. And continuous scales measure bulk material as it's moved in the process. And one of the things that makes continuous scales a little different is they'll have two measurements. 
they will have the measurement of rate. So how many pounds per hour or tons per hour are moving across or, or being transferred at this particular moment. And it'll also have an accumulated total. So how many uh, tons of pounds of product have been transferred since the last day, week, month shift, whenever the last time the totalizer was reset. Uh, I, I kind of describe it like this. Um, it's like the speedometer on your car. You know, if you're driving down the road and you look down at your speedometer, it tells you I'm going uh, 70 miles per hour. But the speedometer also has an odometer on it to tell you how many miles you've traveled. So the rate, the number of tons per hour would be similar to how many miles per hour you're moving. And the accumulated total would be um, similar to your odometer. Now, continuous scales include things like belt scales. Now, I want to make the distinction between a belt scale and a check weighter. And the difference is belt scales measure bulk material. So that would be things like aggregates or uh, grain or something like that, something that's not packaged, that's being transported by a conveyor belt. Check weighters or discrete packages. So that's kind of the difference between, between the two. With a conveyor belt scale, you have a, a rubber belt, or it's usually rubber, uh, that supports the material. As it's transported, that rubber belt is supported by rollers, typically called idlers. Um, to install a belt scale, you would just remove one of these idlers. You would bolt the, the scale uh, where the idler was, and then you would clamp the idler on top of the scale. Uh, solid flow meters are also considered continuous scales. With a solids flow meter, uh, the most common type of solids flow meter is an impact, and th that's the one I'm showing here. Uh, you have material that gravity feeds through a pipe, and this would typically be powders or granule sized materials. Uh, they would strike the sensing plate, and we measure the force that it strikes that plate with, and we can calculate how many uh, tons per hour or pounds per hour are going through the flow meter at that particular moment. Again, you would also accumulate a total on that. And then loss and weight feeders are also considered um, continuous scales. Now, um, uh, with a loss and weight feeder, it's designed as a feeding device. So a belt scale or a solid flow meter is just going to measure the amount of material going. It's not going to control it, whereas a loss and weight feeder will actually control that flow rate. So with a loss and weight feeder, you have a small hopper, and that hopper uh, has a screw conveyor discharge. And that system will be mounted on load cells. Um, and the load cells will monitor how fast the material is being drawn out of that hopper. And it will adjust the speed of the screw up or down to achieve the desired flow rate. One thing to point out about loss and weight feeders is they're typically used for fine, finer powders and they're typically used for minor ingredient blending. So to give you an example, um, I was in a brick plant one time and they had clay on a conveyor belt. Well, they had a, a belt scale on the conveyor measuring the clay and then just past the belt scale mounted above the conveyor, there was a, lo a loss and weight feeder that was feeding iron oxide into the clay to, uh, to give the bricks the red color. So the belt scale was used as a set point for the loss and weight feeder so that they could add the appropriate amount of iron oxide for the amount of clay that was going across the conveyor. So they're typically used in continuous blending systems as well. This is another point to point out. So all of these industrial weighing systems uh, would use a a strain gauge type load cell. So I want to talk a little bit about how these work. A strain gauge load cell works on the principle that the resistance in a conductor is going to be a function of the conductor's length and the conductor's cross-sectional area. So if you were to take a piece of wire and you were to stretch it, the wire would become smaller in diameter and slightly larger, or slightly longer, um, and the resistance would go up slightly. But the, the change in resistance is very small, so what they'll do to increase that effect is they'll coil the conductor up on a pad so that you're stretching it in multiple places. 
Now they'll take that strain gauge and they'll bond it to a load cell frame or sometimes called a load cell body. And a load cell body is a piece of metal that's designed to deform in a very specific way when a load is applied. Now this is representing a single point load cell. So if you were to, to rigidly mount one end of this single point load cell and apply a load to the other side, you can see that it's gonna flex in four different spots. Well, these are the places that they would put the load cells or the strain gauges, I'm sorry. This is where they would put the strain gauges. And you'll notice that some of those strain gauges are in compression and some of them are in tension. So to farther increase the effect, they'll put that in a wheat stone bridge. The, load, uh, the strain gauges in compression will be opposing each other and the strain gauges in compression will be loading each other. Now, the most important part about this slide though is that in order for a load cell to operate properly, you have to have this deflection. So the load carrier, whatever you're using it on, if it's a bin weighing system or a belt scale or whatever type of weighing application you have is that load has to be able, or that uh, load carrier has to be able to deflect down slightly. Now, typically it's less than a millimeter. So it doesn't have to deflect down much, but if anything restricts that downward movement, uh, the scale is not going to perform well. So now let's look at some of the different types of load cells. There are single point load cells. Um, with a, a single point load cell, they're designed for one load cell to be used per application. So you wouldn't have single, multiple single point load cells in a weighing out in one weighing application. Single point load cells are typically used for um, for small platforms, and the size of that platform will be a specification on the load cell. So, like for example, this load cell here is designed for platforms up to about 600 millimeters by 600 millimeters, and that's about as big of a platform as you would use on a, a single point load cell. So, about 30 inches square. Single point load cells. Um, have a maximum capacity range from uh, one pound up to about a thousand pounds. There are also beam type load cells. They would typically be used on uh, larger platform scales, platform scales that would need multiple um, multiple load cells. And there are different types of beam load cells. This is a bending beam in the upper left here. Uh, there are shear beam load cells, like I show in the middle, and then there are double-ended shear beam load cells. Uh, and again, uh, so these would be used on larger platforms or smaller bin weighing systems, because these things can go up to about 35 tons. Now, which load cell within that group you would pick would de depend on the capacity. So for example, these go up to about a thousand pounds, these go up to about 10 tons, and then these go up to about uh, 35 tons. And then you have compression cells and compression cells are the real heavy duty cells. Uh, they can range with maximum capacities from 150 pounds up to about 500 pounds, or I'm sorry, 500 tons. So they, these can be used on the very large bins. Uh, if you think about 500 tons, if you had a four-legged bin, uh, you could get up to 2,000 tons in that weighing system. Uh, compression load cells would also be the type of load cell that would be typically found in a vehicle type scale. So if you had a truck scale, it probably has multiple uh, compression load cells in it. And then finally, out to the far right, you have uh, tension load cells. Uh, tension load cells are designed to be used for cranes or hanging scales, kind of as the name applies. Uh, this load cell I'm showing here is an S-type cell for obvious, uh, it's called an S-type cell for obvious reasons. And they're ranging capacity uh, from 100 pounds up to about 100 tons. Looking at some of the different types of bearing systems, you have a single point bearing system. So here they're using a, um, a bending beam load cell. Uh, this could also be an S-type cell uh, mounted here underneath this, or, or it could be a shear beam or different types of load cells that you could use in a hanging application. Um, you could have three point bearing systems. 
the most common are three point bearing systems and four point bearing systems, but you can go much more. In fact, truss scales will, will have many, many bearing points, uh, some of them as much as, as 10 bearing points on them. Um, one of the things to point out with this slide is, is that the, when you have a three point bearing system, that's typically the preferred uh, for a weighing system. And, and the reason is because uh, if you think about it like a stool, if you have a, a four-legged stool and one of those legs is slightly longer than the other, then the, the stool is going to wobble. If you have uh, three legs on the stool, even if one leg is slightly longer, the stool is not going to wobble. It may not be straight up and down perfectly, but, uh, but at least it won't wobble. If you get into a four-point bearing system, you have to make sure that the foundation is very, very level. Um, because any, um, if it's not perfectly level, you will be preloading load on one of the load cells, one or more of the load cells, uh, which can cause errors in the scale. If you have more than four bearing points, then you have to, um, you may even have to get in and shim these load cells so that they are all um, equally loaded at the empty when the, when the vessel is empty. Uh, the other thing to point out is is that the load carrier, the you know the plate here, the silo here, has to be um, has to float freely on top of the load cells. If that is binding up in any way, you won't get that vertical deflection that you need for the load cell to measure accurately. But because it's floating on the load cell, you have to protect it from being lifted off of the load cell. So you have to have some sort of lift off protection. Um, here I'm showing a, a piece of structural steel that extends in between a piece of structural steel and silo just above it. So that if it were to lift up more than a millimeter, it would come to rest against that and it would prevent it from lifting any farther. Uh, you could also use a piece of all thread rod uh, captured on one end, runs down through the foundation. There's a small gap between the foundation and the nuts on the bottom. Uh, you would use two nuts. One, uh, you use jam nuts to so that the the uh, nuts didn't loosen up in the application. And that way, it could lift off, you know, a thirty second of an inch or so, but it wouldn't uh, lift off enough to um, where the low cell so could slip out from underneath it. Again, because it, oh, I'm sorry. I, uh, we have, if you purchased a mounting unit with the load cell, they typically will have lift off protection built into it. And the way we, we provide lift off protection in our mounting units is you have a bolt that goes from the base, the mounting base to the top plate. Um, the top plate has a tapered hole. The bolt has a tapered head. Um, if this were in normal operation, the tapered head would not be tightened against that tapered slot or the tapered hole. There would be a slight gap there. And uh, if it were to lift off, the top plate would come to rest against the tapered bolt head and prevent it from lifting off more than, more than the millimeter required. You also have to protect the load cell or the load carrier from shifting off the load cell laterally. So you want to protect it from lateral forces. You would do that with stay rods. Uh, you can see they're just a piece of structural steel mounted to the foundation. You have a, a fairly large piece of all thread rod that would extend to the load carrier. Uh, the, the all thread rod could flex slightly to allow the deflection that you need in the load cell. Um, but the all thread rod would also prevent it from uh, any lateral movement in the load carrier. Now I'm showing two on this load cell. You could have uh, one per load cell, or you could have two, just depending on how much uh, lateral force you're expecting. Um, if you have a, a rectangular load carrier, you would want to have at least three. You would always want at least three uh, stay rods. And with a rectangular load carrier, you would want two that are parallel to the short side and one that's parallel to the long side. If you have a round load carrier, like a, a round vessel tank um, hopper, you would have a 
a stay rod at each of the supports for the silo or the hopper. They would be tangent to the hopper and they would be 120 degrees apart from each other. This is an example of how one customer did theirs. You can see it's very similar to this drawing here. They have a piece of some structural steel come, support coming off of the foundation, some all threaded rods going out to the, um, the tank's leg, and, and the, uh, they, they're using two stay rods in this application. Again, if you uh, had the mounting unit with it, you could order the stay rods with the mounting unit. Um, it, and we can put up to two stay rods on our on our mounting units, so that protection will be built into the mounting unit. Now, one thing I want to point out about this is when you have a bin weighing system and you're you're wanting stay rods because of the amount of weight that you're talking about, uh, you would typically want to have a structural engineer involved to evaluate this, whether or not the stay rods are large enough, um, and you would want to. A structural engineer that's familiar with the area where it will be installed because even in different areas the stay rods could need have different requirements for example if you're mounted inside in louisiana where the ground's fairly stable and it's not going to get a much uh, effect from from wind or things like that uh, you may not need very large stay rods on the other hand if you're out in california uh, where there's seismic activity, you wouldn't want the stay rods to be fairly large. Um, so they would take much larger stay rods in, in an area where there's going to be seismic activity. So uh, so you really need a structural engineer to evaluate it based on the area where it's going to be installed. So now we'll get into some load cell diagnostics. Now, the output of a load cell is going to be a millivolt signal that's proportional to the load that's applied to it. And it's dependent on four things, what that, what that, that output is going to be. Uh, the first thing, it's going to be the characteristic value of the load cell. And this will be part of the load cell specification. So it may either uh, specify it as the load cell characteristic value, or it may be specified as C with a small n. Uh, it will also depend on what the load cell's excitation is, and it will depend on the load cell capacity obviously the load applied would affect it as well. So the load cell characteristic value is specified in millivolts per volt. A very common characteristic value is two millivolts per volt. A very common load cell excitation is 10 volts. So let's say you had a load cell with a 500 pound capacity. When you applied 500 pounds to that load cell, the output would be 10 volts times two millivolts, which would be 20 millivolts of output. Now, if you wanted to figure out what the output would be at some value less than maximum capacity, you would just set it up as a ratio. So you would look at, okay, I've got a 500 pound load cell, I'm applying um, 250 pounds to that. That 250 pounds is 50% of my total load. So my my output's going to be 50% of, uh, of the total output, which would be, in this case, 10 millivolts. Now, most weighing systems will have onboard diagnostics. The modern weighing electronics can tell you, hey, you've got an open wire on your load cell, or you know, this load cell's being uh, overranged, or there's, uh, this output's too low, and things like that. So it's monitoring those load cells for their health. But if you look at a typical weighing system, this will be a typical weighing system. You have multiple load cells out there in the application. Now these load cells will have an analog signal. This millivolt signal will go back to a junction box where all of these signals will be combined and brought back to the weighing electronics. But when you have this set up, these onboard diagnostics, they can still tell you that, hey, I've got an issue with a load cell, but it can't tell you which load cell because all of the signals are brought back on one analog signal. So um, what you would have to do if there were a load cell failure is you would have to come out to this junction box. You would split the load cells out 
use your multimeter to determine which is the bad load cell and then replace the load cell. And, and you know, the thing about load cells is they are in harsh environments and they will fail from time to time. So, so that can be an issue. Well, well load cell manufacturers recognize that um, probably around 20 years ago. And to deal with it, they came out with uh, digital load cells. And digital load cells digitize the signal. You still have the analog strain gauge, but it digitizes the signal inside the load cell. Now they daisy chain the load cells together and they bring it back as a digital signal. So now the diagnostics and the weighing electronics has vis visibility all the way down to the individual load cell as far as its diagnostic capability. But digital load cells never really gained widespread acceptance. And, and the reason is because they're very expensive because you're having to pay for all that digital circuitry and everything on each individual load cell. And your know, load cells being in such harsh environments, they're gonna fail from time to time. So your maintenance cost is very high on a, a system with digital load cells. What Siemens has done is they've come out with a digital junction box. So now you still have the inexpensive analog cell out in that harsh application, but instead of going back to an a analog summing box, we go back to a digital junction box. So those, dig, those analog signals are uh, converted to digital signals, and you have one digital signal that comes back to your weighing electronics. So now, the weighing electronics can evaluate each individual cell. So now it can tell you, well, you have a wire breakage on load cell number two. So when the, uh, when the technician goes out to replace the load cell, all he has to do is go to that cell, pull it out, put the new load cell in, and, and the system's back up and running. You know, I, I know I, Early on, I told you I was going to keep talking about this. Uh, the important thing about the slide is, is that load cell has to be able to deflect. And when you look at the common sources there, one of the most common sources is some restriction in the ability of that load carrier, be it a, again, a bell scale, it could be a, um, you know, a bend weighing system, whatever it might be, is its ability to deflect downward. Anything that restricts that is going to impact the performance of the scale. So you have to look at, you know, how your fill pipes are set up, how your draw, uh, any ladders that are attached, if there's conduit runs that are attached to the ladder, that all has to be separated out. Now, obviously things like dust collection and uh, discharges and fill pipes can't be separated out, but there are things you can do with those as well. You can have soft couplings on the fill pipes. Um, if the pipe is small enough, uh, you can put like a, a, a C-bend in it like this to allow some deflection in that piping, deflection in that piping. Uh, you could have a slip coupling like I show here where um, this joint can slip up and down in this uh, in the in the discharge pipe. And it, it's really somewhat sensitive. Um, I did an installation out in the Mojave Desert. I was there with a, a service guy and while he was installing it. And it was interesting because he saw the coupling and immediately said, that's going to be a problem. He said, we'll, we'll hook it all up and see what happens, but this is going to be a problem. And well, it was out in the Mojave Desert and this, this um, flex coupling was very large. It was a big one. It was about 18 inches in diameter. And uh, it had been in the Mojave Desert for many years, so it was very dry and brittle. So it had gotten hard and it wasn't flexing like it was supposed to. So we, we went ahead, we, he put the, the scale in, the load cells in under the bin, he did the calibration on it, and um, we would put the weight on and it would read one thing, and, uh, or put the weight on, take it off, it, it would read zero one time, the next time it would read something different, sometimes it would read zero again, sometimes it would read something different. And he said, okay, let's let's unbolt that flex coupling. And so they unbolted the flex coupling and the scale repeated beautifully after that. So just a an old um, flex coupling that the plastic or the rubber has become too brittle in can even be enough to affect it sometimes. Now, I think that was a bit of an extreme case because the um, the coupling was so large and the rubber on it was so thick, but, uh, but that's something you have to consider. Anything that would restrict that movement, you have to come up with a way to minimize that. 
You also want to make sure that the load goes directly down on the center of the load cell. If you if you're uh, loading the load cell off to one side, or you're, if you're loading it at an angle or anything like that, uh, that could affect the performance of the scale. I can think of another case where we were out. Uh, we set up a bin weighing system. It was four legs on the silo or on the bin. Everything worked perfectly. We left, the customer calls a week later and says the scale's not working. It's not linear when it gets up in the high end. And what it turned out to be was, as he would load the silos, the legs would separate just slightly. And that was enough to put a lateral force on the load cell. It was preventing the scale from reading a linear up at the high end. It was a very simple fix. We just uh, they just welded a piece of structural steel from leg A to leg B, and leg B to leg C, and leg C to leg D, and leg D to leg A again. But So it was a very simple fix, but just that small amount of distortion in the legs was uh, enough to cause errors in the scale. You want to make sure that you have a good firm uh, mounting base. The foundation for the load cell is, needs to be very rigid, and it can't deflect under load. Remember, this load cell is deflecting slightly. So if your your platform is also deflecting, you're going to find that you know you're you're loading some load cells in the weighing system more than others and things like that. So so you want to make sure you have a good firm foundation for the for the load cells. And you also want to protect it from electrical noise, um, you know, because you're floating on top of the load cell. The only path to ground from the bin is through the load cell. So you would want to protect that with a grounding cable. You also consider, you know, if you had static uh, static electricity were to build up in the silo or on the silo, you know, the only place for it to discharge would be for the load cells. And, and that could obviously uh, damage the load cells. You can see it here on a mounting unit. It comes with a with a grounding cable. So now I'm going to talk about some specific applications, and and this is a customer that makes PET, and PET is one of the most common plastic polymers used. Um, it's made up of three components. It's made up of PTA, IPA, and glycol. Now, PET is used in a lot of different things. It can be used to make polyester cloth. Uh, it can be used to make plastic bottles, but depending on how it's going to be used, these three components will be blended together in different recipes. So when this customer got a customer a PO from their customer, it would say, I want 10,000 pounds of PET. I want it to be X percent of PTA, X percent of IPA, and the balance to be glycol. Well, the customer was having a hard time adjusting their batch size every single time. It wasn't convenient for them to adjust their batch size, and they found that they were producing a lot of scrap material. So what we were able to do for this customer is we came in and we put the IPA and the PTA uh, bins on load cells. Uh, we used a, um, a batching module, a weighing module, to control the screw conveyor that was used to transfer the material from the raw material bin into the mixing bin. So now they're um, uh, blending the, the, they're controlling the feet of that screw based on what that ratio is that they want from the, uh, for that particular blend. We used a Coriolis meter to measure the glycol going in and to stop the pump when the desired amount of glycol was reached. Uh, we used a point level switch to make sure that the batch was completely discharged uh, from the mixing bin before they started the next batch. In other words, if there were some products that had a different ratio of components in it that was already in the mixing bin, that would contaminate the, the next batch that they were running. running. So the, the, system is, uh, the customer installed the system and they ran it for about three months. And after they ran it, they did a study and they found that they had increased their efficiency by 27%. That's a huge savings, a uh, huge efficiency increase um, by implementing this weighing system uh, through the reduction of the amount of scrap material they were producing. Uh, this is another application. This is actually one of my favorite applications because it exists in a lot of different industries for one thing, but also because it um, it has a very fast ROI. 
Now here, this happens to be in the grain industry. Uh, very common when loading trucks or rail cars is to load them to 90% of their capacity. And the reason they do that is because they don't want to risk overfilling them. And they're typically not weighing the material as it goes into the truck or the rail car. They'll fill it to 90% of its capacity. They'll take it out to the edge of the plant where there's a truck or a track scale. They'll weigh it and then they'll send it down the line. Uh, and sometimes they don't even weigh it on site. They weigh, send it on to uh, the receiver and whoever's receiving it do the weighing. So it's really, they, they, they won't fill them typically more than about 90% of their capacity. The other thing is if it gets out to the truck scale and they find out that it's, it's overweight, well, trucks and rail cars are designed to dump. They're not designed to take a little bit of material out. So it's a little, it's kind of challenging uh, to take a little bit out. So to avoid that whole, all of those different scenarios, they fill it to about 90% of its capacity. Now, the problem with that is you're wasting 10% of your shipping capacity. I, I had one grain handler put it to me like this. He said, effectively, I pay to ship every 10th rail car empty. Wow, when you think about it in terms of that, that's that's a lot of expense. So, um, and in fact, later that grain handler told me they actually pay for the system on the first, first train they loaded. Um, as I said, we've done this in grain in the grain industry. We've done it with limestone. We've done it with fertilizer, loading ships. Uh, we've done it with sand, plastics, roofing granules. Uh, we've even done this with municipal sludge. And it's interesting. The municipal, the the customer that did it with municipal sludge, he was telling me they were spending about two million dollars a year. Um, shipping municipal sludge for disposal. So if you think about 10% of 2 million, they're paying $200,000 a year to ship air. That's that's a huge expense. Back to the grain customer, what we were able to do for the grain customer is we installed a solid flow meter. So you had a drag conveyor that was feeding a bucket elevator. The bucket elevator would go up to a diverter valve. They would divert the material either into the rail car or into the truck. So with the solids flow meter installed between that drag conveyor and the bucket elevator, now they can measure the material as it's going into the rail car. So now instead of filling the rail car to 90% of its capacity, he's filling it to 99% of its capacity. So they're able to save 9% on their, say, on their uh, shipping costs per year. Now going back to the municipal customer, you think about that, that's about, um, $180,000 a year they're saving by weighing the material as it goes into the back of the, the truck. It also gives you the added benefit of, of verifying your, your billing scale. So if you have a truck scale that's out near the plant, uh, near the edge of the plant, uh, you can check it to make sure it's right. If, if that scale were to develop an error, uh, you may or may not know that until its next calibration cycle. And it also reduced equipment wear. Going back to the municipal customer that was running trucks up and down the road to haul this municipal sludge, if they can make 10% uh, fewer trips, that's less wear and tear on those trucks. So there's there's added benefit there as well. I'd point out too that you know we have a full line of weighing products and we can do it with multiple weighing products. We can do this with belt scales, uh, measuring material as it's loading a ship. Now this is uh, this is measuring fertilizer. And this is one of those cases where they were using the receiving scale at their customer site to, ver to determine um, what the shipping weight was or how much they were gonna pay for the product that they received. And uh, when they installed the belt scale, they installed the belt scale to better load the ships. Uh, but what they found out was the scale they were basing the, the money on uh, had some significant errors in it. So by uh, by installing this bell scale, they they, found, they figured this out and, and in fact actually went back and rewrote the contract. So now they use the belt scale as the billing scale. Our belt scales are NTEP certified, so they can use those as the cash register if they need to. Um, We've done this with Ben Wang systems, as they show here, and we as we did in this application, we've done this with solids flow meters. And you know, 
you know, that's one of the things about Siemens. You know, we do a lot of different material handling measurements. We probably have one of the broadest portfolios of of material uh, handling type instrumentation. So, you know, we we have radar level measurement systems for the for the bin to measure the level in the bins. We do weight measurement with with uh, bin weighing systems. We can do weight measurement in the process with belt scales and solids flow meters. So that's a very strong um, area for Siemens in their in their portfolio. Well, that's my presentation for today. I, I hope you found some useful information in it. If um, we'll open up for any of the questions that may come in via the chat. In the meantime, I'll leave my contact up, information up there. If you have any uh, questions you think of later, you can feel free to, to contact me or you can contact uh, Lesman, your, your local uh, Lesman sales representative, and uh, we'd be happy to answer any, any questions that you may have. Thank you, John. That was a lot of information there. And um, so really want to thank you for all the, the different um, topics you discussed. I do have a couple questions. So the first one is a, a question that asks, are stay rods always recommended or is there a certain size object weight of an object when stay rods become necessary? Stay rods would always be recommended on anything that's not using single point load cells. And the reason you don't need them on single point load cells is because, because they're used as a single load cell per application. You don't get that interaction between the load cells. So you can actually bolt the load carrier to the load cell. But any load carrier that's gonna be floating on top of that, even with a platform scale, they'll typically have stay rods built into that system to prevent lateral movement. Understood. Thank you. Another question that came up was um, accuracy of these types of products. Are they typically referred to accuracy as a percentage of full scale or of span? Well, accuracy in load cells gets really kind of interesting. It's what they'll do is um, well to answer your question. Um, it's typically of of uh, percentage of load. Uh, so it would be just your weight measurement, it wouldn't be a full scale. But but there, when you look at load cell accuracy in the specifications, it's really kind of crazy. There's, they'll list this much creep and this much of this and this much of that. And you know, some of these will affect some weighing applications, but not others. So for example, if you had load cell creep, if you had a check weighing system where you're moving many, many packages across there a minute, um, how far it creeps in you know, 30 minutes is a non-issue because every weighment is less than a minute apart. Whereas if you have a bin weighing system where you're gonna sit out in the application for a long time, creep can be an issue. So really what I'd recommend doing is, is when you're looking at accuracy, you wanna work with a trusted vendor that can tell you, you know, I've got this type of system, I've got this much dead load, I've got this. Uh, they would size the load cell, determine, you know, what the accuracy of that system would be for you. Now, they're going to tell you in accuracy from a lab environment standpoint. So you're going to have external influence that you have to consider as well, but you can discuss those with them. You know, you can talk about, you know, if you have, if you're in, you know, North Dakota where you have a lot of wind uh, wind loading and how that's going to affect it and different things like that. So, it, you know, when you're looking at a large bin weighing type system, you really want to talk to uh, your vendor about the load cells rather than, than just um, buying a load cell and, and sticking it in the application. Great. Thank you. And then there's one last question that is, what is the process for getting a load cell? So, um, these are all really great questions, by the way, Jim. To, to purchase a load cell, um, what we would do, you know, you could if you called in and said, "Hey, you know, we can, uh, we need a 30-ton compression load cell. 
we would be willing to supply it. We wouldn't prevent you from buying it that way. But what we would typically do, if you had a bin weighing application, we would fill out an application data sheet and we would send that into our engineering group. And our engineering group would look at it and say, you know, this is what I recommend. Um, these are the things you want to be careful for. Um, and this is the type of accuracy that you could expect from that system. And it's uh, when you're looking at a large weighing system like that, you know, there's a, there's a considerable investment there. And we want to make sure that that you can have a product that you were that you're going to be happy with, you know, that the weight measurement is going to be something that's going to be useful to you and that you're going to be happy with. And, and that's how we do that is, you know, we use these application data sheets so that our engineers can review it and select the, the best possible fit for that application. Great. So to summarize that, I guess our customers would work closely with, with their Lessman sales rep to complete this ADS. And then they would, the, the Lessman rep would submit that to the factory and work with the engineering group to make a recommendation. That's correct. Great. Well, that ends the questions that we've had thus far. So as a reminder, if anyone has any additional questions, they can feel free to contact John at his email, which is on the screen. You can certainly give him a call or you can certainly contact your sales rep within Lessman Instrument Company. So with that being said, I'm going to end the webinar now and I want to thank everyone for participating and I want to thank John again for being uh, a great uh, a great presenter today. So thank you very much everyone and have a fantastic day. Thank you everyone.